Deuteronomy 10. At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood, and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up unto the mount, having the two tables in mine hand. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments which the Lord spake unto you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. And I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark which I had made, and there they be, as the Lord commanded me. And the children of Israel took their journey from Beeroth of the children of Jacan to Moserah, where Aaron died. And there he was buried, and Eleazar his son ministered in the priest's office in his stead. From thence they journeyed unto Gudgoda, and from Gudgoda to Jotbath, a land of rivers of waters. At the time, at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to minister unto him, and to bless his name unto this day. Wherefore, Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, according as the Lord thy God promised him. And I stayed in the mount according to the first time, forty days and forty nights, and the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also, and the Lord would not destroy thee. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, take thy journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him? and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God's, the earth also with all that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods, and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt and threescore and ten persons, with threescore and ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. So when looking at this chapter, we find there's a few events that God just kind of passes over very quickly. If you were to look at Deuteronomy chapter 9, what you find here is events mentioned from Exodus chapter 32. Because remember, Deuteronomy is a retelling of the law. It's basically Moses about to set the people, the second generation after, into the promised land. But he wants to reiterate to them the law that perhaps many of them had forgotten. But he tells it again, as he did a first, the first time, a little bit more concise, some extra details, but most of it is just pretty brief. So in that first verse there of Deuteronomy chapter 10, it says this, At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. Now you can go back to Exodus, keep your finger in Deuteronomy 10, Exodus chapter 34, and right away you see 
Verse 1 of Exodus chapter 34, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone. Okay, so we're grabbing that same event right there at Exodus chapter 34. Now before that, go to Exodus 32, and in verse 19, Exodus 32 and verse 19, it says, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hand and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. So there's the reason why then a second table of stone needed to be made. And that grabs us, Deuteronomy chapter 9, and in verse 16, where the same event takes place. And I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a molten calf, and ye turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. Verse 21 says, And I took your sin, the calf which he had made, and burnt it with fire and stamped it and ground it very small, even until it was small as dust. And I cast it thereof into the brook that descended into the mount. And of course, if it goes into the mount, into a brook that's descending down into the children of Israel, that same event takes place where he's forcing the people essentially to drink of it. And that's from Deuteronomy chapter 9. Now look at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 9. And in verse 25, it says, Thus I fell down. Before the Lord forty days and forty nights, as I fell down at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you, I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people in thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now this is just briefly discussed and briefly mentioned in passing. And when we dealt with this last week, Deuteronomy 9, I grabbed a hold of that phrase, thus I fell down, and verse 26 says, I prayed. I fell down, I prayed. And this was Moses' heart in dealing with the people of Israel and their many sins before God and in, in, in contradiction to the law that he was trying to give them. He didn't go at them, and aside from the one time in anger when he smashed the tables and then he, he made them drink of it and he gave them a tongue lashing. Once the anger had subsided, he noticed their rebellious heart and that they were not hearkening unto God. He knew that they were rebellious from the day that he first knew them. And so rather than continuing on and getting after them in their sins, he fell down and he prayed unto God for them. And again, that's just mentioned briefly in the context of Deuteronomy chapter 9. But go to Exodus chapter 33. And we find here, like I showed you, Deuteronomy 10 is Exodus 34. Deuteronomy 9 is Exodus 32. And so you have this whole chapter, Exodus 33, that's not brought up again in Deuteronomy chapter 10, or in Deuteronomy. But rather here, it's mentioned and actually gives more clarity to that moment and that time when Moses went and interceded for the people standing before God in between them and a wrathful and angry Lord, between God and a, and a wrathful, a wrathful and angry God and a people that had sinned against him, Moses stood in the gap and pleaded for them that Moses, that Moses would have God give mercy unto his people. Go to Exodus 33 and in verse 7. It says, And it came to pass, when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he had gone into his tabernacle. And so what this is mentioning here in passing is the moment in verse 7 when it says, Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp afar off from the camp and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. So Moses is super angry with the people. He smashes the tables. We hear that he's going and praying for the people. But before that, and at the same time, he first picks up the tent, the tabernacle of the congregation, and brings it without the camp into a place afar off from the camp, names it the tabernacle of the congregation, gives it a title at this time. 
and then essentially draws the line of those which are of the camp, of the people, of the general populace, and those that would come and seek the Lord. He's clearly dividing the two groups, just the general people from those that want to seek after God. He takes the tabernacle, takes it without, afar off, without the camp, and separates it very clearly and distinctly from the world. So that those that want to get a hold of God, which seek the Lord, have to go out unto the tabernacle of the congregation that was far without the camp, far without the world. They had to make a great traveling, a great journey to get to what at that time was known as the house of God, the tabernacle of God's people. They traveled afar to get there. Moses made it a little more difficult for them, which actually proved the hearts of the people. No longer could they just step out their front door and be in the tabernacle. No, Moses was so angry with the people, understanding that no matter how hard he'd labored with them, they refused to obey. And so he just ripped the tabernacle right from under their nose and put it afar off so that they would have to actually make an effort to get there. It continues on in verse 8, and it says, And it came to pass, when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. So Moses arises, and he makes that journey to the tabernacle. He goes out to that tent, to that house of the assembly, and as he's doing so, the camp goes to their door and watches him go from afar. They watch from the comfort of their own home as the man of God goes unto the tabernacle by himself. Verse 9, it records, And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Now, clearly the invitation was given in verse 7 that everyone which sought the Lord could come out and go unto the tabernacle. And yet here the Moses, the man of God, stands up and he starts his journey out at the time, I believe, when worship was appointed, at the time, I believe, when, when the, the praise of God's people, when you could seek God at this time, was to take place. And instead of joining Moses, the people just stand and watch from their tent door. And it's, it's, it's funny because we almost see the same thing happening today, where instead of people getting up and making the effort of going to the tabernacle, the house of God, and meeting with the man of God, and meeting with God at that time, they would rather stay in their own tents, in the doorway, and watch from afar and see the miracle that's happening of the cloudy pillar falling, see the miracle that's happening of the man of God going and praying and seeking after God for their, on their behalf. They watched from afar. Now, was there a cause for them to stay home and not go to the tabernacle and worship there? Well, of course there was a cause. Look at this. Verse 35 of the previous chapter, Exodus 32 and verse 35, it says, And the Lord plagued the people because they had made a calf which Aaron had made. Very clearly there was a cause. There was a great plague sent from God. Why was that plague there in the first place? Because of the idolatry and wickedness of the people. God sent a plague. Okay, so of course we are all justified in staying in our own tents, hiding away, letting the man of God go to the tabernacle. We're not going to make that effort. We're going to stay here safe. There's a plague out there. It could get us, right? The Lord could smite us with that plague that he gave us for our wickedness and for our sins. Now, verse 28 of that previous chapter records... And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Wow. 3,000 men had died of this very plague that God had sent upon his people. God judges the people for their idolatry and their wickedness. So we're all going to stay in our tent doors. We're going to watch from afar what's going on down at the house of God. We're not going to leave our houses. We're going to hide away. We're going to shelter. That plague could get us. We could be numbered among the 3,000 that were destroyed by the plague. Now the Bible records, and we read that in Deuteronomy chapter 10, at the very last phrase of that chapter, it says that God took a handful, about 70 people of, of the people, of, of, sorry, of Abraham, and he made of them a multitude as the stars of heaven. Now look up there tonight when you get a clear sky and count the stars and see how many you can count. The thing is, is that once you start counting stars, you'll see the clear ones, and then in between them there will be many more that until your eyes really focus, you can't see them. 
On the clearest nights, you can see that essentially the whole sky is lit up with stars. You could never even count them. Millions upon millions of people. And historians record that at the time of the Exodus, there was likely at least two million people that went out with the children of Israel. And so what do we have here? Well, we can't go out into the tabernacle. God sent a plague. There are millions of us, and yet for the millions that are here, 3,000 of them died because of that plague. So let's shelter in. Let's hide away. Let's stand in our tent doors and watch from afar what's going on in the house of God. It's exactly what's happening today. Today in Ontario, there are 2,700 dead of the COVID virus for all the millions of people that live here. And yet so many people that would call themselves believers, that would say that they're seeking God, that would say that they're Christians, that they would say that they're believers are hiding in their tents, watching from afar via the internet or whatever, the things that are going on down at the house of God instead of joining in what's going on there as they ought to. So yes, they're justified. There's this great plague. 3,000 have died of the millions that are present. So they're justified. Stay home. Watch the man of God from afar as he goes down to the tabernacle, as he goes down to worship, as he goes down to pray for the very people that God is now judging with the plague. Let him worship alone. We can all worship in our own tents. It's the same thing, right? It, it, it's no different. As long as I can see what's going on down there, I'm justified. And that's exactly what the people did. They stood in the tent door, watched Moses, the man of God, go down and pray unto them. And remember, Deuteronomy only recorded that in about two, passage, or two verses. It said that Moses went, fell down, and he prayed for them. But all this was going on at the same time. The people refused to go down, though the invitation surely was given to come unto the tabernacle. If you want to seek God, though it was removed from the camp, Though it became a little bit more inconvenient than it was last week, the welcome is still there. And, and God's people should have complied. They should have got on board. They should have got behind Moses. They should have followed him there. Instead, they watched from afar in their own place. And I'm telling you today, watching from afar in your own place will never be a substitute for the congregation of God's people. Especially will it never be a substitute for meeting with God face to face. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 11 records this, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Look what they're missing by standing afar off and seeing the man of God go down to the congregation. Moses is here enjoying one to one time with God while the other vast majority of people are safe at home, avoiding the plague, not making the effort to get down to the tabernacle of the congregation, not making the effort to follow the man of God. But here he is enjoying time with the Lord face to face as a man speaketh with his friends. Now, personally, I'll take speaking with God face to face over safety any day. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up my opportunity to go to the tabernacle just so that I'm not 3,000 out of a million that succumb to a virus. I will take my chances to get that opportunity to speak with God as a man speaketh to his friends. And I don't think, I don't think God was, I don't think God was, uh, come on in. You can come in. Anyways. I don't think God was, was just limiting that one-to-one -one friendship time to just Moses. I believe anybody could have come down and enjoyed that. But it's amazing, and we find that in this time, in the time of the Bible, men will do, they will give up just about anything for a little bit of safety. Now go to verse 11, the second part, Exodus 33. And it says, And he turned again into the camp, but his servant... Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Now, in this scenario, I would prefer to be like Joshua. It's clear that Joshua had followed Moses, maybe afar off, maybe he wasn't even seen of Moses at that time, but he followed him unto the tabernacle rather than waiting in his own tent. Be like Joshua, and look what happens with him. 
It says he departed not after the tabernacle. Even after the service was done, it was Joshua's desire to stay in the Lord's house, to be with the Lord, to be present, and to have God's presence there with him as close as he could be. During and after the ministry is complete, one, Joshua, is there in the tabernacle with the man of God as he's on his face, begging God, talking to God as, as you speaketh to a friend, that the people could, be, or could receive mercy from the disaster that's being put before them. Now, this is an interesting verse too. Watch the walk of God's man here, because essentially what happens is Moses gets up, goes to the tabernacle of the congregation. No one falls with him except for Joshua here, seemingly. Moses goes in, enters in, talks to God face to face. When that ministry is done, the Bible describes that the cloudy pillar falls upon, and everybody's witnessing this from afar off and in their tent and not partaking of that great miracle. When it's all said and done, he stands up, turns again into the camp. Joshua stays behind to meet with God. Perhaps he wanted a moment with God one-to-one -one there. Now watch as Moses walks back. He heads back to the camp. Does his talking with the Lord even stop? No, here's an encouragement to pray always because Moses clearly in verse 11 has turned and he's returning to the camp. Verse 12 though says, And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people. And thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. And thou hast also found great, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, and that I may find grace in thy sight. And consider that this nation is thy people. This is Moses walking back into the camp. He spent time with God on his face, praying face to face with him. But it didn't end there. It didn't end when he left church. He kept praying as he walked, begging God and pleading with them the case of the people that he is looking at, walking to. This nation, they're thy people. Give grace unto them if you've given grace unto me. Said mercy unto them as you've sent mercy unto me. And God responds and said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. That's a singular verse, but that also binds nicely with, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. The promise there is if you go with God and God goes with you, you have rest. And Moses is like, look, verse 15, And he said unto them, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? What's the proof that we've got grace in your sight, Lord? Exodus chapter 33 there in verse 16. What is the proof? Well, the proof is that God's with them. And that was what was talked about of the people in the surrounding nations so long ago. What nation is like unto this nation that has God so nigh unto them? What nation is like this nation that has such righteous and good statutes and judgments they follow after? Moses says, God, if you're not going to go with me, then don't come at all. Don't send us at all. You might as well destroy us now. We need you. Verse 16 carries on. So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. God gives a promise then to Moses that he will perform that thing that Moses is requesting at this time. Verse 18, it continues and said, And I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Here the world desires safety and peace and comfort. And yet Moses is clearly indicating that his prayer is that if, he, if that's all he has, he wants none of it. He needs the presence of God. Certainly Moses here is protected from the certain destruction. Why? Because he is standing before the living God and continuing in the things that he had done before. The only difference is that Moses had taken from the rebellious people the tabernacle, moved it without the camp, and said, There, now, show me an effort that you actually want to see God. Here it is. Come unto the tabernacle. Nobody does. They stay at home for fear of a plague, for fear that they would be 3,000 out of a million that would succumb to this plague. And Moses says, Moses says, You know what, God? I'm begging you for these people. I'm praying thee for these people. Deuteronomy 10 says he's on his face. 
asking that God would forgive these people, show mercy unto these people. He turns again, returns to the camp, continues praying for them, begging that God would be merciful. And he wants his presence to be with them. And Moses, or God says to Moses, my presence is sufficient and I will be with thee. And he says, if you don't, if you won't, then don't bother God. We'll just give up. That's what, that'll be it. But don't start again with me. Because that's what God said. He's like, I'm going to destroy these people. I'm just going to start with you. Moses begs God, rather, to just have his presence. Go with me, God. And, Mo and, and God reveals himself in a special way. Verse 21 down to 23. Though no man has seen God at any time, verse 23 says, And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts. But my face shall not be seen. The Bible promises that no man hath seen God at any time and lived. And yet Moses was able to see a part of God in that special exchange there. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Now all of that falls, all of that chapter falls in that exchange between Moses and God and, and the tabernacle being separated and, and men being invited to come join and yet they're standing off for a plague. They're hiding in the tabernacle only watching, they're hiding in their own tents only watching what's going on in the tabernacle from afar. All that happened in the course of two verses here. Verse 25, thus I fell down. Verse 26, and I prayed there in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Now God beg, or Moses begs that the stubbornness, wickedness, and the sin of these people would be forgiven. He asks God to remember that they're your people. They're your inheritance. You brought them out by your mighty power and by your stretched out arm. God, the world needs to see that you're with these people. Otherwise, they'll start calling you a liar and blaspheming your name. And that was how Moses came at God and asked him grace for his people. Verse 1 then, the restoration of the tables begins. Moses in anger broke them. He scolded and chastised the people, made them drink of the dust of those tables, and then prayed for them. And sometime in that exchange, essentially God said, go make those tables again. Verse 1, the Lord said unto me, hew thee two tables of stone. Verse 2 it says, And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first and went up into the mount, having the two tables in mine hand. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing the ten commandments which the Lord spake unto you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. God here says, take those tables. I will write. And then he says, he wrote according to the first. So in the exact same way that God spoke from the mount is the exact same way that these tables were recorded is the exact same way that when they were broken, God made them again. That which he spake was written according to the first writing. The same thing that he did in the first place. This is another proof that God can preserve his words. And God took that into his own hands to do so. It continues on, and at the very end of verse 4, it says, The Lord gave them unto me. The Lord gave them unto me. What did he give? He gave his words. And this is a deep and profound statement. The Lord gave them unto me. How is this so deep? How is there such great understanding in this? Well, if you go, again, you can go to Exodus, if, uh, if you want, Exodus chapter 34. And in verse 5, it says, and the Lord descended. So remember, once we get to Deuteronomy chapter 10, we're very clearly in Exodus chapter 34. And this statement is made, Exodus 34 and verse 5. It says, and the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the name of the Lord, the Lord God, the merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, If thou, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for thine inheritance. All of that captured in a statement, the Lord gave it unto me. 
just the Lord gave it unto me, but so much more. God actually descended in that cloud, stood with Moses, proclaimed his name, proclaimed who he was, proclaimed his own mercy, and that he would forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin, but by no means will clear the guilty. God of judgment stands before Moses, handing him, giving him the very Ten Commandments, making proclamation of his own righteousness as he does so, assuring the man of God the position of the God whom he serves. Continue on in Exodus 34 and verse 29, it says, And it came to pass, when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of the testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron saw the children of Israel, saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. So to make matters worse, after this meeting and this exchange in the tabernacle and then in the mount, Moses returns and he's glowing for the presence of the Lord being upon him. Now you see why I, I will not exchange a little bit of safety for a chance encounter with the Lord. I want to be where God wants me to be. I want to be available so that when his presence shows up, I'm there. Last place that I want to be when God descends in a cloud upon the tabernacle is back in my tent watching from afar, trying to stay safe, trying to shield myself. That's the last place that I want to be. And yet when Moses comes and he returns unto the people, verse 33 of that chapter says, until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. They were so afraid to face the man of God who had just had an experience with God that he had to cover himself up in order that they could even behold him and be with him and be near him and hear the word that he had and receive of those Ten Commandments again, which he had break in the first time. continues on in verse 34 when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him he took the veil off until he came out and he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he had commanded and the children of Israel saw the face of Moses and the skin of Moses' face shone and Moses put the veil upon his face again and he went in to speak with him it's an awesome thing to get into God's presence. And those only getting secondhand spiritualism are often afraid of those that have the face-to-face -face full dose of the thing. Haven't you seen that quite often? People that get out of church. If you're in church, if you're plugged in, if you're serving God, if you're getting with the program, those people that remove themselves from it, they almost get a fear of you because they know you've, had, you've been in the presence of God. They know that you have been serving the Lord. They can see it all over you. They can see it all over your face. Of course, unbelieving loved ones will sometimes scurry away. Of course, you go to knock on a door and somebody that doesn't want to hear a religious message will lock the door away and scurry away. But our own brethren sometimes who refuse to come and be with God in the tabernacle, but rather stay home, those are often afraid to face those that are full on face to face meeting with God. And here Moses had to cover his face in order that the people could even be in his presence. Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 10, and in verse 6, it says, And the children of Israel took their journeys from Beeroth of the children of Jacob to Mizrah. And Aaron died there, and there he was buried. And Eliezer, his son, ministered in the priest's office. I won't go there, but if you want, you can later. That statement, there Aaron died, goes in Numbers chapter 20, in verse 22 through 29, it talks about Moses, Aaron's death and, and, and how they, they chose the spot and how the anointing of Eliezer came afterwards. <clears throat> we can continue on. In verse 8, at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name unto this day. Wherefore, Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance. And it's a hard cry to say that the people of Israel, or the people of Levi have no inheritance when the Lord God is their inheritance. But what I see here is that at a time when men were removing for fear of the man of God and for fear of the presence of God because of the plague that he had put down upon them, God is still trying to get people to stand with him. Here he, at that time, 
when so many people aren't even going down to the tabernacle, he chooses the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant and to stand before the Lord to minister unto him. This is God desiring that not just Moses, not just Joshua who snuck in there, but now the children of Levi would come. I desire them, God says, to come and to meet with me face to face, to have that intimate relationship with me. And so he appoints even more people to serve before him. Verse 11 says, And the Lord said unto me, Arise, take thy journey before the people, that, that they may go in and possess the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give unto them. Verse 12, it continues on, And now Israel... What doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? Remember, most people are not coming down to the tabernacle. They're, they're afar off for fear of the judgment of God that has fallen upon 3,000 of their family members, of their kindred, of their nation. And yet God here is reasoning with them. He appoints some that they would stand and minister before him. He accepts Moses and talks with him face to face. I believe Joshua also got a little bit of a blessing for lingering and hanging out a little bit longer in the tabernacle as Moses headed his way back. God has forgiven the people for their sins, for their transgressions, for their idolatry. And now he's ready to bring them back. He's ready to reconcile himself with them. But what does God require? Is it such a hard thing? He lays before them. All I require is that you would fear the Lord thy God. That's all God wants really from his people is a godly reverence and fear for him. And you know what? It's not an awful thing to be fearful of the living God because if you're afraid of God, you don't need to be afraid of anything else. And most of our lives are full of fear of the everything else. Hey, take all of that fear of your health. Take all of that fear of finances. Take all of that fear of the relationships that are falling in this life. Take the fear and dread of serving God that you have down here and just give it all to him and fear him instead. And watch as that other things, those other things just fall away and melt away. When you fear God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great and mighty God, suddenly there's no fear in anything else. So what does God require? Just fear me. Just revere me, just love me, just dread me above all things. And it says to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. That's what God wants. He wants a heart and soul connection with his people. It continues on in verse 13. It says to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Remember, his commandments and his statutes are not grievous. They're for thy good. They're for your own good. Why do we always look at the commands of God, the Ten Commandments, and the others that fall in, into the Scriptures and the New Testament statutes and judgments? Why do we look at them as some sort of dread? Oh, you mean I can't drink alcohol? Oh, you mean I can't fornicate? Oh, you mean I, I, I should be chaste until I'm married? Oh, you mean I can't lie, cheat, steal? What is God trying to do to me? Is he trying to ruin all my fun? It's for your good! It's for your good. And this is what God is saying. Fear me above all things. Keep my ways. And that is for your own good. You may not think it's for your own good. You know, the little child, when you tell them to not play near the street, they don't think that's for their own good. They're, why can't I play here? There's grass over here too. This looks fun. This looks wonderful. My parents are so mean. The four-year-old doesn't understand, but the truth is, is that the adult knows that just on the other side of that is the street, where there is danger, where there is potential death and injury. The adult knows that. The child doesn't know that, but the command comes for the good of the child. And God works the same way in our lives. He gives us these commands. He brought in mercy the Ten Commandments again to lay them before the people for their own good. That's a gracious God. That's a merciful God. God. That's a God that loves you and wants to have a good relationship with you. He wants people to be close. These are light requirements. It is not some heavy thing to follow God. It is a light 
thing. Even the affliction that you go through through serving God from your family or from your peers or from your coworkers or from your friends, when they afflict you for serving God, that's a light affliction. That's nothing in compared to what God can do, and that's what God has proved himself to do. He judged his people severely in order to prove a point so that they would come back into his fold and have fellowship with him again. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Verse 14 continues and says, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God. The earth also, it's just added in there. You know, God owns the heaven and the heaven of heavens and the earth also, of course. It says, With all that therein is. It belongs to God. You have needs today? God can provide because he owns it all. Verse 15, Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, and as it is this day. God, in all of his glory and majesty and wonder and strength and power and owning the heaven of heavens and the earth also, saw it fit to love you. That's a special thing that God would reach out to people in particular to love them. What does he require? Just fear him. Walk in his ways. It's for your good. Verse 16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. This is a spiritual circumcision. This is us putting off the flesh in a figurative way from our standpoint looking back. Don't be stiff-necked. Don't be hard-hearted. Don't be rebellious against the Lord. Rather be vulnerable. Verse 17 continues, and it says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty, a terrible, which regardeth not the persons, nor taketh reward. He judges righteously and can't be bought. That's what that is saying. He is above being purchased or bought or swayed or manipulated, and yet he still reveals that a man, Moses, can go before him, fall on his face in humility, and bend the will of God. That's power that we have with heaven. And you know how we get that power? When we fear God, when we revere him, when we keep his commandments, and when we come before him as a humble servant and petition him. God will talk to you face to face as he did with Moses. God will make your face to shine so that others would fear you as he did with Moses. God will grant your petitions. God's, God will repent towards decisions that he was once going to do. As he did for Moses, so will he do with you. He's a righteous judge. He respects not persons. In other words, he will give to Moses the same thing that he will give to you. He doesn't take reward. Verse 18, he doth execute judgment of the fatherless and widows. He loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Our God provides for those that have nothing, are limited, are weak, are poor, fatherless, widows. God loves the strangers. God loves those and cares for those that are without food and raiment. He us to behave the same. He desires to know you and he desires you to serve him and to be as he is. Verse 19, love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. In other words, treat others as you'd like to be treated. Remember from whence you came. Remember when you were worldly. Remember when you didn't know the Lord. Remember when you were sinful. And, and forgive others when they get tripped up and trapped up in those same things that you have fallen short of in the past. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. Verse 21. He is thy praise. He is thy God that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. What a miracle to think back on all the wonderful things that you have seen the Lord do in your life. He ought to be your praise. He ought to be your God lifted up and highly esteemed as such. You ought to fear him. You ought to treat him as the God of gods, the Lord of lords, that great and mighty God. You ought to treat him as if he owns the heaven of heavens. You ought to treat him as if he owns the earth also. He has it all, and yet he wants you as well. He wants to meet with you face to face. Let him be your praise. Let him be your God. Let him continue as he has done in the past. Do great and terrible things for you. Verse 22 says, The fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons. Seventy people went down into Egypt. They went on faith. They went on a promise that, that they hadn't even seen but for faith. Abraham was called to a land that he had never seen, to 
sire a nation that he only saw a handful of them on this earth. And yet it says, And now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Millions upon millions of people came out of those three score and ten persons that had enough faith to get up, to go, to follow, and to fear God above all things. And this is what God desires to have with us. Fear him. Walk in his ways. Love him as he first loved you. Keep his commandments. Follow his statutes. You're in good hands. Doing so is for your own good. But I love that. The opportunity that we have to be with God face to face, to pray unto him, to seek him with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, so that when you're in his presence and return afterwards, you glow. And people will know they have been with God. That's what God wants for all of us. Face to face interaction, a close relationship, a love, a friendship, a bond. You know, it's for our good. Believe that, trust that. You have that available to you. God doesn't respect persons. He'll judge you the same way he would judge some of his great men of God of the past. They had the same like passions as us. They had the same sinful thoughts, desires, tendencies as we have today. And yet God met with them. What is man that God is mindful of him? The son of man that he visits him? We're really nothing. Believe that and then go to the God that can make you something. Pick you up out of the depths. Give you mercy. Give you strength. Give you Provide for you all your needs. Go to him. He wants you to meet with him face to face. Though sometimes he makes it difficult. And that's what he did. That's what he did through Moses. The people of He took the tabernacle out of the camp. Made it a little bit more difficult. A little bit more challenging to seek after him. In the last three or four months, hasn't it gotten a little bit more challenging to meet with God face to face? To meet with the congregation? To meet with God's people? Hey, it's not going to get any easier. God's always going to allow for challenges to set in in our lives. But if we're with him, following him, watching after him, believing on him, trusting him, we will go through challenging things, but we'll also get to witness the God who is our praise, the God who is our Lord, the God who we ought to fear above all things, continue to do great and terrible things, and our eyes will see it. And we will be rewarded with the sights and sounds and joy that comes with being in a relationship with the God that loves the fatherless, the widows, the strangers, those who need food and raiment, those who are down and out without hope. That's who God wants to love and get in a relationship with and work with because that's where he can get the most glory. Continue to praise him, trust him, follow after him. That's what he wants. Meet with him face to face. That's what he desires. We ought to desire the same thing. Get after God. 